Good morning, you're listening to FloridaDaily.net, and I'm Kim Parr. This morning, my guest is Kermit Baker, the Chief Economist with the American Institute of Architecture. Kermit, how you doing? I'm doing well, Kemp. Good to be with you again here. It's been two years since we've done an interview together, and my audience has been missing hearing from you. One of the reasons that I shifted away is because you told me that you were semi-retiring. This uh, AIA thing was the only gig you were going to do, and you were kind of stepping away from being a Harvard economist and looking at the lira, the uh, leading indicator of remodel activities. So what have you been doing for the last two years? Well, you know, I've managed to keep busy, Kemp. I did step back from my work at the Joint Center for Housing Studies, so I've sort of eased up on my research work recently, but kind of doubled down on my uh, tracking the economy. And as you're well aware, the last couple of years have been a very dynamic period of time in terms of our economy. So I've been able to keep busy trying to figure out what's going on there, quite frankly. All right. We're down in Sarasota at the Resilient Floor Covering Institute's fall meeting, and you're presenting tomorrow. We just got the September AIA billing index, and the number is lower than we've seen in a while, right? It's a lot lower than we've seen in a while. Let me just back up a little bit, Kemp, and give you a little context here in terms of what's going on in the residential market and what's going on in the commercial, the non-residential commercial and institutional market. And the residential side's been quite weak. Home building, you know, has suffered, obviously, from very high house prices and very high mortgage rates. So that's been slowing down. The uh, non-residential side has been going gangbusters. You know, the spending numbers are up 20 percent uh, year over year over the first uh, eight months of the year. So a little bit of a tension there. And, and we use the architecture billings ind- index as a way of sort of tying those all together. The architecture billings index, a measure of revenue activity at architecture firm. Uh, the research we've done indicates it's a very accurate leading indicator of what's going to go on in the non-residential sector with a 9 to 12 month lead. So our billings index, I would say, has been moving sideways for about a year yet. Its index is centered around 50. 50 indicates no growth in design activity nationally. So it's kind of been bumping between 49 and 51, really no clear direction. But as you mentioned, Kemp, the the number we released last week for the month of September did take a very significant dive, and it's the weakest number we've seen in our index since the heart of the pandemic. So, you know, I I, I think it got our attention. We're concerned about what that might mean for the future. And one month alone doesn't make a trend, totally appreciate that, but it was kind of reinforced from a couple other things that we determined from that survey. Number two, we independently track new project work coming into architecture firms. And that was just as weak as the billing. So architecture firms are, number one, not seeing as much activity on an ongoing basis, and number two, not seeing as, as much new work coming in. The third piece of the puzzle here are backlogs at architecture firms, and they're, they're still fairly healthy, but they've been moving down too. They've moved down about 10% over the last year, down from you know, slightly over seven months on average, down to about six and a half months. So this sort of triple whammy of billings being down, new work being down, and some of this backlog evaporating certainly has our attention, and we're going to be looking at that pretty intensely moving forward. One thing we're going to particularly be focusing on is what's happening to that backlog. In in prior downturns, we see project work being stalled, being delayed, being put on hold, and extreme cases being canceled. That would be a red flag for us if, if we're seeing that current clients are bailing on projects or significantly downsizing them. That would be a very clear indication that things have gotten worse for the construction sector. As it is now, I, I would see. I would say we're, we see a, a yellow flag here, and we're going to start watching that more closely to see what direction it goes. All right, so I was looking at those numbers the other day, and three months ago, the strongest region was the Northeast, and now the strongest region, they're all below 50, but I think the one at 49 is the Midwest. What's that telling us? Well, the Midwest is typically not a strong growth market, so it is a little bit odd. On the other hand, you look at the sectors within the non-residential market that are doing the best, and I would point to three. Uh, Number one, far and away, is the industrial sector, the manufacturing sector. Well, the Midwest is known for, you know, its focus on uh, manufacturing activity, so that's that's certainly part of it. The the second sector that's going very strong is the distribution market, logistics, warehousing, things like that. That's, That's pretty 
much you know, across the country, but I'm guessing the Midwest probably gets a little more of its share of that than some other regions. Number three is data centers. Uh, data centers are pretty small market, but rapidly growing. To me, I don't know if there's much of a regional pattern to that, but you know, I think the point is that it's not an even market across the board. We're still seeing a lot of weakness in the, in the office market, in the brick and mortar, uh, standard brick and mortar retailing market and things like that. And some of these oddball sectors are really driving growth. And because of that, it, it's really distorted the regional pattern of what we've seen uh, over the last several years. I just got a Moody's report the other day, an economist, and he was talking about some of the sectors that were a flag and you know, commercial real estate, big one, CRE. And they were talking about even multifamily. If it's not out of the ground yet, the projected values of those properties are going to be lower. So if you haven't built it yet, don't build it kind of thing. So we're going to start to see some cooling. And and another factor is the office market in these urban areas. They're interviewing customers and the the tenant holders say they only need 75% of the space that they needed prior to COVID. So those are some factors to watch, right? Those are very critical factors to watch. Yeah, we are seeing, you know, as I said, a lot of unevenness in this market. And you, you, picked uh, a, a couple of them where, where we're really seeing problems. The multifamily sector, I think, a little bit di- different because that was super strong. Uh, architecture firms were telling us as recently as a year, year and a half ago, that was their strongest sector. Now it's absolutely the weakest sector. I think we overbuilt that that market a little bit. Rents are starting to go down. Uh, property values, as you suggested from the Moody's data, you know, apartment values, multifamily housing values are down almost 15% year over year. So, yeah, we need to wait for that market to pop back up. I, I think it will, Kemp. They'll have a housing shortage out there, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a cooling off period. The, the office market is in a heap load of trouble, I think. It varies a lot from, you know, from market to market, but, but overall, we're clearly overbuilt. And it's kind of as you're suggesting, Kemp, I don't think we know the full picture on that yet. I, I saw a statistic recently that half of the companies in the U.S. have not signed or re-signed an office lease since the pandemic hit. They were working off a 8, 10, 12-year lease that may, they may have signed in 2018 or something like that. So when that comes up, as you suggest, you know, they're probably going to make some adjustments to to what they need, you know, scale back and get out of it entirely, move somewhere else, you know, we'll see. But, you know, even three and a half years into the pandemic, we haven't seen the full impact of that yet. One potential there is, are we going to see some conversion of unneeded office space? unneeded retail space. We've already seen a lot of it. A lot of the strip malls, you know, where there used to be stores are now, you know, sort of neighborhood uh, drop-in healthcare centers and things like that. Offices, we've heard a lot about the potential of converting offices to housing, particularly affordable housing. Turns out that's not as easy as it sounds, but I think there are opportunities there. And I think as we see more and more weakness on the office side, we're going to see pursuing opportunities to really find a, a better use for that space. Okay, last question. We talk about the billing index being a leading indicator all the way out to maybe 12 months. So as we crystal ball what 24 is going to look like in the election year, we're probably going to see housing bring us out of this hole first. Hopefully a little bit as, as houses start to turn, some remodel work being done, and then we're going to see a cooling probably on the commercial side, right? Absolutely, a commercial and a cooling on the non-residential side. We do a consensus forecast that camp you may be familiar with, and our most recent numbers indicate 2% growth in 2024 on the commercial side. That's nominal growth, so that's that's negative once you factor in inflation and increased cost of construction. Even weaker on the commercial side, modestly okay on the institutional side, healthcare, education, amusement, and recreation, look to be the markets that, that hold their own. But, but you know, like I say, a lot of hurt coming on the commercial side, I believe. Okay, Kermit, well, it's great to be with you, and thanks for talking to our listeners again. We'll have to do this again more often, given talking to Kermit Baker, the Chief Economist with the American Institute of Architecture, and you've been listening to Kempar and FloridaLA.net.